Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 7 on Hume's problem of induction. The objectives for this video are the following. After watching, everybody should be able to. Number one, explain Hume's traditional problem of induction. And number two, describe the role played by the principle of the uniformity of nature in our inductive reasoning. Now, there's only two objectives for this video. But importantly, the first is perhaps a little more difficult to achieve than those we've seen so far. Uh, that should be an indication that the material we're about to see is a little bit more complex than the stuff we've seen so far. Um, so in particular, after this video, we want to explain why Hume's traditional problem of induction is indeed a problem. Now, last time, we saw that the epistemic probability of a statement depended on two things. It depended on the stock of knowledge and the inductive logic used to grade the strength of the argument from that stock of knowledge to the conclusion. And we saw that if a claim about the future has a high epistemic probability, then we predict that it will prove true. And as the epistemic probability of a claim decreases, so does our confidence that it will prove true. We're now in the realm, of course, of inductive arguments. The conclusions of deductively valid arguments, remember, don't contain anything that isn't already implicitly said in the premises. So to conclude something new, we need to move beyond deductively valid arguments. So we use inductive ones. Now, we also said that we're concerned here with the following problem. How do we rationally justify a system of scientific inductive logic? Now, the first step in doing that would be to give a suggestion as to how we rationally justify any system of inductive logic. If we can do that, then the hope is that we can narrow down on this case of interest of a scientific inductive logic. Now, this problem was first raised by this guy, the philosopher David Hume. And in fact, Hume advanced arguments to the effect that no such rational justification of inductive logic is possible, never mind of a scientific inductive logic. We, however, will focus on Hume's arguments in the context of our specific case of interest of scientific inductive logic. So what we're going to do is look at Hume's argument in more detail. Now, it's important first to understand what Hume meant by a rational justification. And it's something like this that Hume had in mind. This says, A system of inductive logic is rationally justified just in case it is shown that the arguments to which it assigns high inductive probability yield true conclusions from true premises most of the time and the E arguments to which it assigns higher inductive probability yield true conclusions from true premises more often than the arguments to which it assigns lower inductive probability. Uh, here an E argument is just an argument which has some stock of knowledge as its premises, so the E stands for epistemic, uh, and this is the same terminology that the book uses. So with this in mind, if we're to go ahead and rationally justify a system of inductive logic, we have to show two things. One, that the arguments to which it assigns high inductive probability yield true conclusions from true premises most of the time. And two, the arguments with a stock of knowledge as premises to which it assigns higher inductive probability yield true conclusions from true premises more often than the arguments to which it assigns lower inductive probability. Now, Hume thinks this is impossible. So why does he think this is impossible? Now, he argues this is impossible using an argument by contradiction, which is also called a reductio ad absurdum. And the strategy of that argument is when you assume a result and you argue that the result is contradictory. So what you end up concluding is the opposite of the thing you assumed, the opposite of that result. So what Hume does is this. We assume first that we can rationally justify a system of scientific inductive logic. By that definition, that just means that we can do two things. Number one, we can show that the arguments to which it assigns high inductive probability yield true conclusions from true premises most of the time. 
And number two, we can show that the E arguments to which it assigns higher inductive probability yield true conclusions from true premises more often than the arguments to which it assigns lower inductive probability. This is just what you meant by rational justification, remember, these two things. Now, since we can rationally justify, uh, we can do these two things. So since we can show one and two there on the screen, then we must be able to show them both in one of two ways. Now, if we have shown them, we must have shown them in a forceful, persuasive way. And the two methods of establishing conclusions in a forceful, persuasive way we've already seen. So here's a question. What are the two methods of establishing conclusions that we've seen so far in this course? Now, either you establish these things by a deductively valid argument, or we establish them by an inductively strong argument. And the contradiction that we're after is obtained by arguing that neither of these two methods do an adequate job of establishing the conclusions one and two up there on the screen. So first, we suppose we try to establish one and two using a deductively valid argument. Then the premises of that deductively valid argument can only include things that we know. We do not know what the future will be like, I mean, if we did, we wouldn't need this class, right? So those premises can only be about things in the past or the present. They can't be about things in the future. Now, since the argument is deductively valid, the conclusion makes no factual claims not already made by the premises. So the conclusion can only refer to the past and the present too, because that's what the premises refer to. But if we look... The phrase most of the time in clause one of this conclusion and the phrase more often in clause two of this conclusion mean most of the time in the past, present and future and they mean more often in the past, present and future. So if the conclusion only refers to the past and the present then it does not establish what we need it to establish for rational justification. It would have to talk about the future too. So this is bad news for the deductive argument approach. And so deductively valid arguments cannot establish what we want. So we turn to the other option. We suppose we can establish rational justification using an inductively strong argument, the second of these methods that we use to establish conclusions. So we ask, what makes it an inductively strong argument? And we say, well, because it has a high inductive probability. And then the reply is, but what system of logic assigns it a high inductive probability? And the idea is that we would want to say, well, scientific induction is what assigns it a high inductive probability. But what's happened now? Now we've assumed that scientific inductive logic is reliable in order to prove that scientific inductive logic is reliable. And this is a fallacy, so here's another question. What is the fallacy called? So, if we try and establish one and two, the clauses of rational justification, by an inductively strong argument, we're reduced to begging the question, or if you like, circular reasoning. And this is more bad news. So, we can't use an inductively strong argument to get what we want, either. And so, what have we seen? We can't use a deductively valid argument or an inductively strong argument to establish what is required to rationally justify a system of scientific inductive logic. Since they are the only ways we could do such a thing, we have obtained our contradiction. So it follows, after all, that we can't rationally justify a system of scientific inductive logic at all. And that is what Hume's traditional problem of induction says. Now, we'll talk for the last few minutes about the problem of induction viewed through a slightly different lens by talking about it in terms of the principle of the uniformity of nature. This will come up later, which is why we're introducing it here. Now, it's difficult to formulate precisely, so we'll try and get a grip on it by looking at an example. So suppose we ask a scientist whether a rocket would work in space beyond the reach of our best earthly telescopes. 
And yes, she might say, and she might explain why by way of appeal to certain principles of theoretical physics, say. Now what the scientist is doing is judging the following argument to be inductively strong. This argument says, principles P1, P2, and so on, correctly describe the behavior of material bodies in all of the many situations we've observed. Therefore, principles P1, P2, and so on, correctly describe the behavior of material bodies in those reaches of space that we have not as yet observed. What underlies this argument is the assumption that like causes produce like effects throughout all regions of space and time. And this roughly is what we mean by the principle of the uniformity of nature. Now in particular, it says roughly that the future resembles the past. And we see this in other arguments that we judge to be inductively strong too. And so the thought is that the principle of the uniformity of nature underlies our judgments of inductive strength. Perhaps then there's a way out of Hume's problem. Suppose we could give a precise formulation of the principle of the uniformity of nature, and we use that to explain our judgments of inductive strength that we get from our system of scientific inductive logic. So we rationally justify our system of scientific inductive logic using the principle of the uniformity of nature. However, a very similar line of reasoning to what we just saw when we tried to provide a rational justification before applies again. Now, the details of this line of reasoning I've left as an assignment question, so do have a go and work through those details. That's going to help with the understanding of everything that's going on here. So, the long and short of it is that this isn't a way out of Hume's problem after all, and in fact, we run into the same kind of difficulties. Now, there's another proposed way out of Hume's problem, uh, and that is the topic of the next lecture video. That proposed way out is called the inductive justification of induction. So that's where we're headed next time, and I'll leave it here for now. So finish off with your self-reflection, and I'll see you next time.